morning we turn again for our scripture reading to the gospel of our Lord Jesus recorded by Mark and uh, chapter 9 and uh, this morning we're going to read uh, the verses following what we were looking at in our two sessions yesterday we read from verse 14 down to the end of verse 29 Mark chapter 9 at verse 14. And when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them, and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were amazed, and running to him, saluted him. And he asked the scribes, What question ye with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, but they could not. And he answereth them and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed for me. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oft times it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. And Jesus saw that the people came running together. He rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried, and rent him sore, and came out of him, and that he was as one dead, insomuch that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him up by the hand, and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he was come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could not we cast him out? And he said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. And in there at verse 29, and may the Lord once again bless to us the reading from his holy word for his name's sake. Now before we turn to the word together, let's just turn again to the Lord and ask his blessing upon it. Our great God, we bow before you again and worship you and all the wonder of your person and your triunity. We worship you as Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God, the only wise God, the one who is great beyond our imagining the one who is infinitely holy in your wisdom and your power and your tender mercies toward your people. Lord, you are the one who has created us in your own image that we might walk with you and that we might share fellowship with you and with one another in you. We thank you for such privilege that you have given to us. You have given us these lives to live you have appointed the bounds of our habitation. You have surrounded us with all the most gracious and helpful influences that we have. You have written your law in your heart and you have given that to us in your word also. And yet we have to acknowledge that we have sinned against you. That we have come so far short of what you have for us that we have marred and ruined that image that you desire to perfect in us. 
Lord, we confess that we have not lived up to the privileges that you have given to us. We have transgressed your boundaries. And we have violated your law. And even despised the influences that you set before us. As we confess our sins and our failings again. We ask you your mercy and your forgiveness and your grace. That with clean hands and pure hearts. We may worship you today. Lord we do marvel that you are the one who is waiting to meet with us and to speak with us. In the very inner rooms of our hearts. That you are the one who is freely offering your fellowship to us. Even in all our need and in all our weakness. We pray therefore O oh God that as we turn once more to your word. That it will please you to speak your word just to the condition of each heart as we are known to you. We pray, O oh God, that your name might be glorified as we worship you together. That as we leave this place, we will leave behind all our sin and our fretfulness and our unworthy desires and all our unkind thoughts of others and even of yourself. And Lord, we pray that you will give us grace to surrender our souls. Our lives are all to you afresh this day. We ask all these things, praying for your blessing upon us and upon all the church of Jesus, wherever your people meet this day. We ask in his name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. One day with my son Stephen, it's a few years ago now, we set out to climb four peaks in the Mourne Mountains. You know where the Mourne Mountains are, County Down. Now we started with the lowest one and we finished up, of course, in Sleeve Down, the highest one. You know, it reminded me of the Christian life. Put into lines in an old poem that I remember learning as a, as a young Christian. It was on a plaque and a wall in a house that I was in whenever I was working uh, there at one time. And it went like this, beyond each hilltop others rise like ladder rungs to loftier skies. Each halt is but a breathing, a breathing space for fresher pace till who dare say our night descend there can be such a thing as end. And that of course is a reality in the Christian life, isn't it? There's always more ahead. There's always higher ground to be gained, as it were. But that time in the mornings that day reminded me of another reality of the Christian life. It's just the simple fact that there are no mountains without valleys. You see, the expectation of always living on a, on a mountain underneath a cloudless sky is really out of touch with the reality of Christian life in this world in which we live. You see, the, re the reality is that when you're on a mountain top and you have to move on, there's only one way to go, and that's down into the valley. That was our experience in the mornings. And this was the experience of Jesus and the disciples after the transfiguration event. But it was not only a geographical movement. From that peak of spiritual light and glory, they came back down to face the reality of a fallen world. A valley situation full of darkness, demonic activity, and failure. And that's a pattern that's frequently repeated in Christian experience. Times of blessing and prosperity and can often give way to periods of testing and disappointments and pain. From seeing the glory and the majesty of God, we can be brought down to seeing the need and the poverty and the lostness of our human lot and our own weaknesses. From hearing the voice of God on the mount, we descend to hear the raucous tones of accusation and argument. And the plaintive cries of human pain and suffering. 
for moments of wonder and revelation, such as Peter had at Caesarea Philippi. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you. You can very, very, very quickly come down to fail to honour Christ and actually find ourselves, as we noted, unwittingly on Satan's side. Someone has said that true Christian experience involves not only meeting God in the secret place, but also meeting men in the marketplace. And having dealings in the marketplace of life can bring with it all sorts of problems, as you and I know. All sorts of temptations and testings and failures. But it's in this kind of situation that faith comes into its own. It's in those situations that faith is tested and that God is gently leading us in his own way in order to increase our faith and in order to teach us more about himself and increase in the knowledge of him in those situations that we're in in order that we might trust him more. Consequently, there are two things that we need to consider in this text that is before us in verses 14 to 29. One is just simply the reality of failure. Verses 14 to 18. And the second one is, of course, the question of faith and unbelief. In verses 19 uh, to 29. Now looking at the first of these. Jesus and the disciples had come down from the mountain again in order to rejoin the other nine disciples. The others had probably been left in Capernaum. And as the three with Jesus were heading down in the direction of where they were. They met them. Met them on the way. And they were surrounded by a large crowd. And they were in the midst of a heated argument. And they were facing the reality of failure. In their ministry. Now there's a double tragedy. To this particular failure. And the first fact about it that made it such a tragedy is that it's something that was being exploited by the enemies of our Lord Jesus. You have that in verses 14 to 16 there. See, the problem had arisen because a man had come to the nine disciples seeking help for his son. The boy was apparently epileptic from the descriptions that we have in the New Testament, but he was also possessed by an evil spirit. And the disciples had found themselves powerless and unable to help in the face of this situation. Now it's worth remembering that these disciples were the very same disciples who had already gone out in obedience to the commission of our Lord Jesus himself to preach the word of the kingdom and they were enabled in those missions to perform the signs of the kingdom, the healing of the sick, the casting out of demons, the delivering of those who were afflicted with evil spirits. And you remember on one occasion they returned from one of those missions and you remember how they returned. They returned just as excited as a schoolboy football team that had scored a hat trick in their first competitive match. So much so that Jesus had to warn not to rejoice so much in the fact that the demons were subject to them. That's what they were saying. Lord, wonderful. The very demons are subject to us. And Jesus said, I say unto you, don't rejoice in the fact that the demons are subject to you. But the fact that your names are written in heaven. But now, it's those very same disciples who demonstrated those, those signs of the kingdom. And they now find themselves powerless, helpless, defeated. And exposed to open ridicule by the enemies of Christ. And of course, where something unusual has happened in the usual crowd gathers, among them, you see, were these legal experts who were so implacably opposed to Jesus. And this is 
precisely the kind of thing that they were waiting for. See, here was an excellent opportunity to belittle publicly the movement that had grown up around Jesus, especially when Jesus was not present. And how quickly these men pounced on the helpless disciples. Now the comments and the questions of the scribes are not recorded for us, but obviously the disciples were having a very tough time. They were not well equipped for public debate. And of course the point that the scribes were always trying to make was that this movement was not of God. You see, their minds were set on this conclusion that they were... Glad, and they were glad of anything that they could lay hold of as evidence in its direction, no matter how inconsistent it might be. You see, if the disciples of Jesus performed miracles, they said that these were wrought by the power of the devil. Or Jesus himself performed miracles, they aligned them with Beelzebub, the very prince of the devils. That to them is evidence, you see, that the movement was not of God. But on the other hand, if they fail to perform a miracle, this too is construed to prove that the movement was not of God. And of course, there's still plenty of critics today who, like the scribes, they just love to ridicule and to make fun of God's people in the same kind of inconsistent way. You see, if as a Christian you take God's word seriously and you seek to follow faithfully the teaching of Christ and to follow our Lord and the way of the cross, you know what they say about you? They brand you as a fanatic and an enthusiast. On the other hand, if, like the disciples, you're overtaken by failure and shortcomings and you don't live as consistently as you should with the word of God, they'll call you a hypocrite. So really as believers we're in a no-win situation as far as our critics are concerned. You see as followers of Jesus we're no more immune to failure today than the disciples were then. And we're no more exempt in criticism either. It's one of the costs of following Christ that we must be prepared to take. As a believer, as a Christian you can expect criticism. You must be ready to be ridiculed. It's one of the costs of following our Lord. One of the costs of going in the way of the cross. It's one of the things that keep many people from openly professing Christ. Fear of being criticized. Some of us look back on our own lives and we remember the way in which the fear of what people would think and say and the criticism that we knew would be leveled against us it kept us back from publicly identifying ourselves with Christ. See, the fear of man creates that fear of man within us that the book of Proverbs tells us brings a snare into our lives. But it is a comfort, however, to know that God never leaves his people alone in this kind of situation. Just when the nine disciples were being humiliated in this way, Jesus appeared. Now his arrival must have been sudden and unexpected as far as the crowd was concerned. It says that they were astonished when they saw him. I suppose many of them were also glad to see him and welcomed him into their midst. Not necessarily because they had sympathy for the boy, but they were hoping that something would now be done. Uh, something that would uh, be exciting. You see, it's very much in keeping with crowd psychology to welcome anyone or anything that will add a bit more spice to the existing excitement and argument. And uh, also the common people, of course, had no great love for these religious leaders who made so many impossible de demands on them. And they liked to have someone around who could take them down a peg or two. But Jesus immediately came to the rescue of the embarrassed disciples. He rounded on their critics and he demanded of them, what are you arguing about with them? And it was the turn of the scribes to be embarrassed. They had obviously nothing to say. Jesus' demeanor and Jesus' word and their past experience of being silenced by Jesus was enough to silence them now. Jesus loved the disciples. 
He wasn't going to let them be tempted above what they were able to bear. And you know, it's just the same with us. When faced with our failures and defeats and the storm of criticism that we get from the enemy, we need to remember, as one old hymn writer put it, his love in time past forbids me to think he'll leave me at last in darkness to sink. He never will. None will ever take them out of his hand. So that's the first tragedy about this failure of the disciples. The way in which it was utilized and exploited by the enemy in order to ridicule the Savior. But there was another party there that day for whom it was a great tragedy as well. Now I suppose for most of the crowd that day the failure of the disciples to deal with the problem and the ensuing argument probably had little more than entertainment value. They were enjoying the excitement of it all. As far as the scribes were concerned the disciples failure was largely an academic question with certain religious implications that they had gleefully, gleefully exploited. But there was one person there for whom it was neither an entertaining nor an academic situation. For him it was hurting. And the longer it dragged on, the more it hurt. And that person was, of course, the boy's father. He wasn't concerned about the pros and cons of the argument generated by the scribe. He was concerned about his boy and about his need. You know, that's a very practical reminder to us about keeping our priorities, our priorities right in Christian service. You see, there's also a modern mentality which views religion in terms of entertainment value. I don't suppose I have to tell you that. You've seen it again and again. People of the mindset who follow the crowd, they go where the excitement is. Their idea of religion is just simply to enjoy yourself, to have a good time. And the bigger the program and the louder the noise, then the better it is. Brother, we are going to the rally tonight. It doesn't matter if you pass six bleeding Samaritans on the way. And again, there's a religious mentality around which tends to view human need as something to be talked about. Something to be discussed and argued over until the cows come home. Or rather, until the undertaker arrives. You know, sometimes in church work, I think that we should call our activities committeeanism. Because whenever any situation of need arises... What is so often done is we have to form a committee. And a lot of the committees do nothing but talk and talk. They argue and debate and they'll refer and defer and they'll propose and counter-propose and they'll delete and they'll add and they'll rescind and amend. Plenty of argument, plenty of discussion, but so little done. Now maybe that's being a bit too critical. But I hope it makes the point for you. You see, just as it was here, in the midst of religious excitement and argument, those with the real needs can be overlooked and neglected. But in the silence that followed the words of Jesus to the scribes, the boy's father grasped the opportunity to present his case again. He explained first that it was his original intent to bring the boy to Jesus himself, but with Jesus being absent, he had asked the disciples to help instead. And he then went on to describe the boy's condition. Note it. It was a very heart-rending appeal. He was an only child, that's a detail we get from Luke 9, 38. And his condition was very complex indeed. The symptoms described by the father clearly indicate that the boy was epileptic, but that was only part of the problem. The lad was also deaf and dumb. 
But unlike the deaf mute that Jesus healed earlier in Mark 7, this condition had a more serious root cause. He was actually possessed by an evil spirit, an unclean spirit, which tormented and sought to destroy him and deprived him of his faculties. It was an example where, as Calvin comments, Satan sought to mix his attacks with natural means. But Jesus was deeply moved by this appeal. But his feelings never narrowed down to one particular, however emotive. The response of Jesus shows that he not only felt deeply for the boy, he felt deeply for the father also. He was not only concerned about the boy's need, he was also concerned about the father's need. He felt strongly about the wider issues that were involved in this situation. Particularly about the attitudes of all those involved. And more particularly still, about the lack of trust in God in the whole situation. And so it's to the question of faith and unbelief that the text now turns us. And that we want to consider. You notice that Jesus began to focus in this particular matter with a rebuke. Of faithlessness. As he asked the boy to be brought to him there. In verse 19. He answereth him and saith. O faithless generation. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. Now of course this is something that has raised a lot of debate. The question is. Who was Jesus rebuking? For lack of faith. Was it the crowd? Was it the scribes? Was it the father? Or was it the, the disciples? Well, my own assessment is that the term faithless generation includes all of them. The general want of confidence and trust in God as a gracious father was evident all round. And there's some evident that the lack, the general lack of faith was a constant heavy burden for Jesus to bear as he shared with men the miseries of this life. Just think of what it must have been like. Try and imagine for a moment what it must have been like for someone. Someone who had never known sin. Someone who had never known his fellowship and his communion with the Father to be interrupted. Someone who had never known what it was to be without that intimate, confident faith, as it were, in the Father. Even in his humanity when he was on earth. And yet he was living in the midst of people who were, well, just concerned about worldly issues and worldly things. With no confidence, no faith in the Father. You know, Paul was quite right whenever he spoke of us and said that God has concluded us all in unbelief. And what we want to do is just to consider this uh, here from the point of view of the different people involved. There was, for example, the crowd. And of course, unbelief is very evident as far as the crowd is concerned. You know, the greater part of the multitudes who thronged Jesus during his ministry are invariably depicted as worldly-minded, self-centered, and materialistic. So often we see them flocking to Jesus in order to get something for free. Jesus had to rebuke them as far as that was concerned. You know. Told them that they were just coming to him looking for earthly bread. Looking for ordinary bread rather than looking for the bread of life. And there were many who came to him, as we would say in Ireland, just to gawk, out of mere curiosity. And of course, we know too, there's evidence that the, the crowd so often deliberately closed ranks on needy ones who were seeking to reach Jesus. You remember the blind man outside Jericho, he's a case in point. 
The term thoughtless crowd is very apt, a very apt de designation of people who congregate in this way. In the hubbub, the needy ones are forgotten or neglected or they're just pushed out of the way. But Jesus wasn't having any of that. And then, of course, there was not only the crowd evidence in their unbelief and their self-centeredness. There were the scribes there. And they, of course, were a hard-hearted lot. For the scribes, the boy was just an interesting case. He was an item on the agenda that provided them with new fuel for mocking the cause of Christ. You see, they weren't treating him as a real human being, let alone a needy human being. There was no compassion or pity or desire in their hearts to see the boy help. Rather, they delighted to witness the inability of the disciples to help. You see, it furthered their ends for the boy to remain just as he was. It enabled them to use him as a pawn in their program of persecution against Christ and against his disciples. And of course, there's nothing new in that. Same kind of tactic is used today by governments and other various bodies. In order to gain political, like a political advantage or social leverage or selfish glory, human life itself becomes expendable. The refugee problem is a case in point. Some of you may be familiar with it. In some instances, indeed in many instances, governments just don't want their refugee problems resolved. Why? Because they can make political capital out of it. Or they can attract financial aid from abroad because of their presence. It matters very little that human beings are hurt or suffering. As long as they can retain power. As long as they can control affairs. As long as they can line their pockets. And that's where so much of the aid goes. It's sent from abroad. You see, the unbelief of the scribes is evident here. This hard-heartedness. I'm sure Jesus was rebuking that too. But there are two other parties here. They're somewhat different. It's the case of the father. Now, the father's unbelief is evident because he makes an open confession of it. And that, of course, made the father's case different from the others. His was a case of a little faith mixed with unbelief. And his unbelief had to be conquered in order that faith could triumph. And you see, this is what Jesus was seeking to teach him. This is where Jesus was seeking gently to lead him. You notice that when the boy was brought to Jesus, the demon seeing the conqueror realized that its tenure was up in the boy's life and immediately threw him into this dreadful convulsion. But notice something else. Rather than ministering to the boy right away, Jesus actually turned his attention to the father. And he puts to him what is just seems to be a general kind of question. He said, how long has this been happening to him? Now Jesus didn't really need that information himself. It was for the father's benefit that he asked. What he wanted the father to do was to reflect again on the reality of his situation. And to be clear in his mind what he was up against. You see, faith is never an irrational thing that refuses to acknowledge that things are as they are. Some people think of faith in that way. You know, they think they're exercising faith and they just deny the reality of what's there. But faith is never an irrational thing. You see, Jesus was wanting to encourage the Father to believe that 
he was ready and willing to help. That is to help with the real problem. Not just simply to ease the distress of the man. Not just simply to make him feel better. The spark of faith, even though still dominated by unbelief, it became very evident in the father's response. He answered Jesus' query. And then he made the pathetic appeal. He says, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Now note that the man was hoping that Jesus could do something. But he still had doubts as to Jesus' ability to help. In this case, if you can, he said. Now just contrast that with the case of the leper back in chapter 1 in Mark's Gospel. Around verse 40 there. You remember what the leper, leper said when he came to Jesus. He said, if you will, you can make me clean. You see, the leper was sure that Jesus could if he would. The boy's father was hoping that Jesus would if he could. He was hoping that something could be done. But he was not at all sure that Jesus' power, that Jesus' effort would be any more adequate for the situation than the efforts of the disciples. Sometimes we all feel like that in our own problems, don't we? We feel that no one else understands. No one else has had to go through what we are going through. We always think of our own case as unique and exceptional. And there is a sense in which every case is unique. The tragedy, of course, comes when we allow that kind of thinking to blank out our trust. in the goodness and grace and the overriding sovereign purposes of God. In our circumstances. And when that happens we often consign ourselves to continuing in an attitude of depression and complaint and wallowing in self-pit. But Jesus didn't allow that to happen in the Father's case. He immediately challenged him. On this very point the faith. In order to conquer his unbelief. Now the exact words of Jesus are very important here. Some of the translations obscure them a bit. But Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible to him who believes. Now notice the play in words here. If you can. See, those were the very words that the man had used concerning Jesus. He said, If you can, help us. And Jesus is now tossing them back into the man's own court. And he's saying in effect, it's not a question of whether I can do anything. It's a question of whether you can. I can and I will. But can you believe? Can you believe that I can do it? Now of course the man himself and in himself and in his own strength. He could no more believe than he could heal the boy himself. But you see, a wonderful thing is happening here. Which always happens when Jesus is present to minister. And especially when Jesus is speaking. Because the words that Jesus speaks, whether they're words of challenge, whether they're words of encouragement, the words that Jesus speaks are always spirit and they're always life. And you see, even as Jesus is speaking here, the words of challenge were at work, generating, creating faith. We know not how the Spirit moves convincing men of sin, if need. But we know that that word is creating faith in Him, as only the words of Christ can. And the distraught cry of the Father to this challenge is something that's very moving. And the more so for its frankness and its downright honesty. The spark of faith has been kindled into action by Jesus' challenge. 
But the man is still so consciously aware, so painfully conscious of his unbelief. And so he gives expression to his inner conflict and agony. He says, Lord, at least he has come to recognize that, that Jesus is Lord. The one who is before him now is the one who is Lord of this situation. Lord, he says, I do believe. Help my unbelief. See, the wonderful thing here is that Jesus had gently and gradually brought this man to the place where he referred his own unbelief to Jesus, as well as referring to Jesus the problem of this boy see notice how Jesus by delaying his attention to the boy he is very gently and very powerfully dealt with the father's need he has gently brought the father to this place of complete dependence upon him and unbelief could never triumph now. You see, it was referred to Jesus. It was truly conquered. Even though the man's faith was still so weak, so weak. But you see, it's not the degree of weakness or strength concerning our faith that matters. It's who that faith is in that matters. And when we come to that place of referring everything to Jesus, that's what makes the difference. And by this time the crowd was increasing, and so without more ado, Jesus turned to the boy and he commanded the unclean spirit to leave and never to enter him again. And so with the kind of reluctance and malignity manifest in such cases, we read that the demon screamed loudly, threw the boy into a final convulsion and departed to the pit. The people thought the lad was dead as he lay there on the ground before them. But then Jesus did a very beautiful thing. He took hold of his hand and lifted him to his feet. And we read that the boy stood up, completely healed. And Luke, he adds another beautiful touch. He says, he restored him again to his father. See, that hand clasp of lifting the boy was his token of the strong hand that the Savior, with which the Savior still raises men from the pit and the bondage of sin and from the depths of self-despair. It was a token of the love grip with which he continues to hold all those who truly trust in him. It was a token of that day in which he will eventually raise his people out of all the limitations of this present evil world, out of death itself, and into the glorious joy and light of his nearer presence. In other words, it's a token of their final restoration in glory. To God the Father. The hand you see that took hold of the boy that day is still outstretched. To raise lost guilty sinners like you and I. Into a new relationship with God. Restoring us again to a heavenly father. Like the words of Charles Gabriel. In loving kindness Jesus came. My soul in mercy to reclaim. And from the depths of sin and shame, through grace, he lifted me. That's what he's doing. And that's what he wants to do. In your case, in mine. Even in those times of failure that come our way as believers. The Christian life is a life of new beginnings. You have a new beginning every day with Christ. Indeed, you can have a dozen new beginnings in any day with Christ. That's what it's about. That hand, the hand from which no one can ever take us, is the hand that's outstretched to lift us, to restore us to the Father once more. 
And just finally, the other part he hears the disciples. And of course, unbelief is very evident in them, in them as well, isn't it? We've already noted that. And it's evident, of course, in their powerlessness. They acknowledge that themselves after they had gone indoors away from the crowd and they turned to Jesus and they said to Jesus, why were we not able to cast them out? I suppose they were thinking of those times when they had cast devils out. Why were we not able to do it this time? After all, they had been out in these missions and they had wrought healings and deliverances in his name. So, well, they might ask, why the failure on this occasion? The answer was very simple. It was lack of faith manifest in prayerlessness and in discipline. This kind cometh not forth but by prayer and fasting. Self-discipline. You see the problem with the disciples was that they were no longer depending on the proper source of strength and power. Only the power of God could deal with a case like this. But clearly they had ceased to humble themselves in acknowledgement of their own helplessness. And to discipline themselves to ask God to display his power in their weakness. And that could well have been just simply because they had seen deliverances wrought like this before. And they rather lazily thought that it would just continue to happen automatically for them. Remember a case like that way back in the Old Testament. Whenever the Philistines come out against the children of Israel. Days of Samuel. Beginning of Samuel there. And the children of Israel have put you the worst before the Philistines. And then someone had a good idea. I suppose they remembered what had happened in Jericho. You know when the ark of God was carried around the city. And they shouted with a great shout. And the walls of Jericho came down. And someone had the idea of going to get the ark and bringing it out into the battle. Surely God would be obliged to give us victory. Then, hadn't he done it before at Jericho? But God's not obliged to give victory continually to disobedient people. Amen. And so they brought the ark out into the battle. And what happened? The ark was captured by the Philistines. And taken down to dwell in the borders of the land for years. See my dear friends reminds us again that we can't live on past experiences. No matter how wonderful they may have been. We've got to be continually coming to God. With the sense of our own weakness and our own helplessness. And our own utter need. Trusting in him and in him alone. It may have been that the disciples had somehow come to think that it was their own standing and their own privileged, their own privileged position as disciples that could affect such miracles. But whatever the reason, unbelief had triumphed where faith was once victorious. And that's a very salutary warning for us because it's very easy for us to slip into the attitude that because we have done something before in the strength of God, that it will always be so. Remember, Samson found that out to his cost. Remember back in Judges 16, whenever he arrived, whenever he rose from Delilah's lap, he thought, and the Philistines were come upon him, he thought to himself, <laughs> just get up and go out as at other times and deal with them. But a scripture very tragically reports. He wished not that the Lord had departed from him. You see there never comes a time. That we can do God's work. In our own strength. No matter what gifts. No matter what talents we have developed. Or God has given us. God's power is never available to the self-sufficient. It's available to those who acknowledge their helplessness and their weakness. And we need to discipline ourselves to keep our eyes facing the reality of what we are in this fallen world, even as believers. And then have our eyes fixed entirely and supremely 
and our confidence solely in Christ alone. That's why Paul explained the success of his ministry in that paradox that you have in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. My strength is made perfect. Where? In my weakness. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So we too need to continually pray, just like this man. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. You alone can deal with it. And that way, we not only triumph on the mountaintop, we'll win in the valleys as well. When he's with us. That's what makes all the difference. And it doesn't matter how weak your faith is. As John Flavel, one of the Puritan spirits, he says, even the weakest faith is still an evidence of our union with Christ. It's still an evidence of the forgiveness of our sins. It's still an evidence of our election in Christ. It's still an evidence of obtained mercy. It's still an evidence of something that we have that can never ever be taken from us. So let our trust, our confidence be in Christ, in Christ alone. That's the secret of increasing faith and of triumphing in the midst of all the needs that we meet in this fallen world and of being more than conquerors through him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his blood. May the Lord bless these thoughts to our hearts. Let's just pray again. O oh Lord our God, we turn to you again with all our needs, whatever they may be. And Lord, we acknowledge that they're known to you. So often, Lord, we just think about our felt needs and so often we just bring our felt needs to you. But you are the God who knows our real needs. And we come to you today remembering that you are the God who has exhorted us to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And so we acknowledge you to be the God of all power, the one who is strong and mighty beyond our comprehension. But we come to you conscious of our own frailties and our own limitations. We come to confess our weaknesses in your presence. And to pray for your grace and your strength once again. That we might serve you effectively. In the place of your appointment. We give you thanks for the privilege of these days. Around your word. We give you thanks O God for all that you have been saying to us. And we give you thanks O God for the privilege of fellowship one with another. And with yourself. And Lord, as we have been meditating in this word again, we pray that you will give to us strong, living, act of faith mm. in your word and your promises. That our trust and our confidence will be rooted in Christ and Christ alone, mm. ever resting in his righteousness, in his atoning sacrifice, ever believing. That in your purposes all things work together for good to those who love you and to those who are the called according to your purposes. And ever trusting in you. Whenever difficulties and dangers and pain lie in the pathway of our obedience to you. Give to us that strong hope that is your goal for us. Whenever defeat and despair seem to stir us in the eye, help us to look to him, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. Hear us, O God, in these and in all our petitions, as we lift our hearts to you. 
asking again in the strong name of our Savior. Amen. Amen.